Praise the Lord. PTL hour in full effect. We'll see. If anyone decides to join us tonight, I don't know. Oh, yeah? Oh, really? say something different. <laughs> My watch says a different time, the iPad, the, the I oven. Said the same thing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's like, don't even pay attention to the one on the wall. <laughs> oh, we still got plenty of time. <laughs> okay, I think we'll get started. Euro, I think the worship team is ready. We're going to have some live worship. She's going to lead us in prayer. And then we'll start some worship, then we'll get into the study. I love you guys online. Live worship, enjoy. Let's praise the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to start out by quieting our hearts and minds before you right now. Lord, we thank you that 
God, you are in control. And all these things that are um, that each one of us is going through right now, Lord, you see and you are using. You have a plan. And even when um, things seem like failures to us, God, you are using them because you're the one fighting the battle and you're the one who's going to have the victory and you're going to use our weaknesses to show your strengths. And so, Lord, we... We just lay the busyness of the week at your feet, God, and all the trials and um, whatever's going through our minds right now just before you. And we just want to come into your presence right now. We ask for you to just fill this room with your spirit, God. And um, Lord, help us just to focus on you and worship you in song and then through the word, Lord. We ask for your blessing to be um, upon this evening. We thank you and we love you and we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, for those online, the first song is The Battle Belongs by Phil Wickham.
next one's called The Stand.
Lord, that was good stuff. That's good stuff. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again. Here it is, the end of the week, Lord, and we just ask that you would just pour out your spirit now upon this place, upon us. Fill us fresh now. As we get into your word, Father, we pray that we would lay our, aside all the distractions that may have come to us during the week that we may have brought in here and online even. Distractions that may keep us from you, Lord. We lay those aside now. We ask that you would help us to stay focused on you tonight. As we get into your word, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Help us to understand these things. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you have for us tonight, Lord. We pray that you would just bless this time and you would bring glory to yourself through it, Lord. So be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. PTL hour is in full effect now. Um, I always say this. I'm going to say it again. I've been saying it for as long as we've been doing this. If you're online, share the page. It's just one way that we can get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Uh, there's people on your page that probably more than likely don't know the Lord. This page is just one way that you can get it out there. So I always encourage you to share, not only on the page, share the page, but share when you're out with your family, your friends, you're at work, you're at school. Whenever the opportunity arises, share the gospel message, share Jesus Christ. The world, if you look around, everyone knows it, especially who's on and who's here, we know. The world needs Jesus Christ, and they need him more than ever. So I always encourage you to do that. If you need a Bible, let me know. I always say this too. Let me know. I will send out one. I just need an address. Don't worry about shipping and all that. It's free of charge if you need a Bible. I, uh, we will send one out to you. I think it's the most important thing you can have in your hands is the Word of God. So if you know anyone who is in need, it's just a basic Bible. It's not some fancy, you know, uh, leather study you know, crazy Bible with a dictionary attached to it and all that. And it is, it's none of that. It's just a regular standard Bible, English standard version, actually. So if you know anyone who needs one, let me know. I will send it out. Always, too, if you guys need prayer, please let me know. Let us know on the page. Put it out there in any comment. Um, you can post and say, I need prayer for whatever it is. Or you could just put your name and say, pray. And I'm sure people will see it and would love to pray for you. Oh, if you're in the area, stop on by. We'd love to have you. We feed our spirits the word of God first and foremost, but last but not least, we feed our flesh and we do that to the full. So we'd love to have you. There's food, refreshment, fellowship afterwards. Anything else? I don't think so. So let's jump right into it. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in Luke chapter 12. Yes, we are still in Luke, and we are still in chapter 12. We're going to read verse 22 through 34 tonight, so not too much. I kind of freaked out my wife earlier when I said we're going through like 47. She kind of looked at me like, whoa, you're crazy. <laughs> so no, it's only 22 through 34. So let's begin. We'll just, let me look at it. Yeah, let's just read it all. It's not too bad. Let's just read it and then we'll start to get into the study. So, chapter 12, verse 22, Dr. Luke writes, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. 
but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so we got some good stuff. It ties in good with what we went through last week. So let's quickly go over a few key things that we saw last week. That way, when we get to verse 22, we can, like I always like to say, hit the ground running. So remember last week, and we've been seeing it as we entered into chapter 12, Christ has been giving some warnings. We've seen the hypocrisy. Beware of hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees, right? Jesus said that. Then we saw last week, beware of covetousness. And we talked about it great length, right? <laughs> That's something we all kind of probably struggle with from time to time if we're being real and we're not trying to be like super holy Christians. Like, oh, I, I never struggle. <laughs> Far be it from me. That never comes my way. You know, I'm, I'm so well versed in the scriptures. And, you know, I pray like seven hours a day. Martin Luther said three. I pray seven you know, type of thing. If we're being real, you know, that's going to come our way. And sometimes we struggle with it. And we talked about it because Jesus says, beware of covetousness. And then he, it says, he spoke to his disciples. That would be all of us. That would be us online if you were a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're a born again Christian, that makes you a disciple. So when the Bible says, Jesus turned and he said to his disciples that we need to take Take heed, we need to pay attention and look, oh, that's us. So we looked at it last week. Beware of covetousness. Now, as we went through, we seen that Jesus is speaking and then we saw this brother stand up and say, hey, you know, I, doesn't matter what you were saying there, Jesus, but I got a bigger issue. You need to tell my brother he needs to be fair, and, you know, 50-50 and share the inheritance. Come on. There's, we don't need, you know, that's so old fashioned, giving him the double portion. You know, that's what they did way back then. It's a new day, it's a new day, Jesus. You know, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And that's when we see Jesus respond, beware of covetousness. That's very important. Remember we talked about, that's an imperative. You must continually beware. You must continually, constantly guard your heart against these things. And then he says, he gives us that warning. And then he gives us the principle. Life is, does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. That is the complete opposite. And I, I pause here for a second because... I kind of want to get into it again because it's so important. Like this is one of those things that you kind of want to hammer and you want to hammer it because it's important, man, because you see the world around and it, we're so consumer driven. We're a consumer driven society and we got to have and we need this and who's got the nicest thing on the block and ooh, you know, so-and-so down the street got a new car. Oh, I need a new car type thing, right? So... I kind of want to talk about it, but I'm not going to. But this is the complete opposite. What Jesus says, that's the complete opposite of the world. The world says, you know, you're winning if you got the most toys. That's what life is about. You got to have the fancy car. You got to have the big boat. You got to have the vacation house. You got to have the big house with the pool and all this other good stuff, which is nice. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. But the world puts a big emphasis on those things. And Jesus says, ah, beware of that stuff. It's not what life consists of. I mean, I just, you know, I helped my mom move recently. and Oh, man. Life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess, Mom. <laughs> so, I love you, but jeez. Oh, man, there was so much stuff, like three storages, a house, and there's two of them. Oh, man, I could go on for days. I love you, Mom. But, oh, 
And we talked about it, you know, when God blesses you, and we've seen that as we looked at the parable of the rich fool a couple weeks back, he was blessed. He had all this stuff. And what did he do? He hoarded it. Ooh, it's all about me, and now I'm set up forever. I could just, you know, say to my soul, you got stuff forever. Just take it easy, you know? Life is good. <laughs> oh, man, I love that movie. <laughs> but you could kick back, and, and, there, and we read, and we looked at it, and there's nowhere in there that he says, thank you, God. There's no, Lord, you've blessed me. Thank you for what you've given me. And how can I use this to bless others? I want to be a good steward with what you've given me. And we've been talking about that the last few weeks because this all ties in. We break it up, and, and if you notice, you'll see numbers. And, and chapter 12, I say it. And it's, that's not really there in the, the original text. There's no, it's no break. There's no chapters. There's no verse numbers. But we're breaking it up so we could take some time. So, but this all kind of runs together, and Christ is talking about living in light of eternity. And we've been looking at that, not living for the now. And he says, beware of covetousness. Why? Because you start living for the now. You put God in the back seat. And I said, it, I said it last week. He's either in the back seat and a lot of times he's not even in the car. You completely forget Jesus Christ. And you start chasing the world and all the fancy things it has to offer. So we need to be careful. And one of the marks of a believer is that he's other that you're other-centered. You're not self-centered. A Christian, a born-again believer, is not a selfish person. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect and we get it right all the time and we're walking on water and we're doing all this stuff. No, but it's still a mark of your life that you're not totally selfish, that you're looking out for other people, that you're Jesus-centered. And when you're Jesus-centered, you start to see the world as how it really is. It's in need. It's dark. It's lost. Your heart breaks when you look. That's how we need to be. And Jesus is saying, beware of these things. Why? Because it's going to make you a self-centered person. It's going to take your eyes off of me. And you're going to start storing up stuff that he said, can't take it with you. What good is that? You see it all the time. You see it all the time. And the question was posed, you know, what are we living for? Are we living for the now or the after that? Because there is an after now. Because we looked at the parable of the rich fool a couple weeks back. And what did you say? Fool, this night your soul will be required. There is a this night if... The Lord should tarry. There will be a this night or a that day for all of us. And when we take our last breath and we open our eyes in eternity, are all we going to have is stuff? Stuff? You can't take it with you. So lay up treasures in heaven. So... As now, as we get into verse 22, he's going to continue his exhortation to live in the light, in light of eternity. So verse 22, he says, notice he says, to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than food. Clothing. All right. So he says to his disciples. Okay, so that would be us. I explained this earlier. That would be us. This is very important. Why is this important? We need to pay special attention to this. Because this can infect all of us. Covetousness. Worrying about all these things because when you look at it, he says, worry about, don't worry about food, what you will eat, clothing, two big things in the world today. You know, th this is big. 
this is big. You, just, you see all the things, and I love to eat, and I love food. You know, <laughs> Anyone who knows me, I love to eat, and I can put it down with the best of them. I may not be the biggest guy, but I'll shock you at the dinner table, that's for sure. <laughs> I love to eat, but the world is so focused on these things. And you start to worry. And now worry is something that we all can relate to. And we're going to get into it. Um, worrying and how we worry. And I got some, some more free information for you guys about what worry does to the body. But we're going to get into that as we move along. But he says, therefore, I say to you. This means as you, as you, go, as you go along through, your, through the word. I, I used to say this a lot, therefore, and you've, if you've sat in Bible study, you've heard that this before. When you see a therefore, then you look, what's it there for? <laughs> you've probably heard that before. So this means that after covetousness has been removed, Jesus is saying, worry should go with it. Okay, so he says, don't worry. So Jesus, we saw, just spoke on greed. It's interesting, too, because greed and worry go together. Greed never has enough. Worry is afraid it will never have enough. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Neither of them notice greed or worry has their eyes on Christ. Neither of them have their eyes on Jesus. Now that word worry, in the Greek, it's merimnao. Mer to have a distracting care. It's actually from two Greek words. Marizo, to cut or divide. Noes means the mind. Or, I don't know if I said that right, so sorry, I don't speak Greek fluently. <laughs> Especially ancient Greek. So, the word worry, when you combine those two, means the dividing of the mind. So, your mind is torn. It's divided. It's not able to focus. Hence worry. A divided mind. Now our word worry comes from the old Germanic word, virgin. That means to rip or tear. Both describe worry well when you look at it. It rips you, it divides you, it tears you. And some of us can attest because some of us are what you would call a worry wart, or, <laughs> you know, if you look up in the dictionary, the word worry, you might see your picture there, and it'll have a phone number, tick, 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 call so-and-so for more answers. <laughs> but some of us like to worry, and we know when you read this, it's interesting when you read the definitions, yeah, it tears us up, it can rip you, worry could just, and like I said, I'm going to give some free information in a little bit, but then he says, what you eat. Basically, he's saying what you eat or what you put on. And he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, the food, and what you're going to put on, your clothes. And I said it a little bit ago, these two things occupy our attention greatly. I mean, <laughs> you, we just passed the new year, right? And resolutions, a lot of them are built around, oh, I need to die. I need to lose weight. I'm going to... That's my resolution this year. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to go to the gym. Not Jim's Burgers. I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> I love that place too. So Tom's too. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> and we just see, we were driving. I don't know what I'm going to say. That. We were driving. And we have a Tom's Burgers over here in Fontana. And uh, we were driving, I think, in Azusa yesterday. And we saw a Super Tom's. And my wife said, oh, look, Super I was like, dang, we don't have a Super Tom's. <laughs> <laughs> I need to try Super Tom's. But anyways, it's these two things are, you know, what we deal with a lot, you know, with weight, diets, exercise. We're so focused. What should I eat? Is this gluten-free? All this, you know. <laughs> this has got too much sugar. Let me turn around all the carbs and let me look at all the nutritional facts and you start, you know, doing macros and different things if you go to the gym a lot. And then with clothes. Oh, man, the latest trend. <laughs> and I'm not a trendy person. My wife laughs at me because I dress kind of the same that I've always dressed. I still shop at the swap meet. You know, I get a $7 
t-shirt. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it don't matter to me. It's just plain black or plain gray or <laughs> whatever. But the world is so into fashion. Oh, you look in your closet. Oh, this is so last year. I can't, I can't wear this. No one's doing this anymore. Or, you know, women with their hair. Oh, oh you see her hair. Oh, this looks so nice. I got to do it that. Oh, my. Oh, you know, you start going off all crazy. Like, you know, we're so fixated on these things. This grabs our attention. But it's interesting that Jesus said not even to worry about these things. These things that take up so much of our attention, so much of our time. Now, we worry about it. You know, people worry about the way you look and, and different things. Why does he say don't worry? Because life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. And if we remember it and we start to fold this into everything else, he's been exhorting us to live in light of eternity. Not to live for now. Here today, gone tomorrow. We've heard that, right? Scriptures say life is but a vapor. What's 70 years if you live that long? Some 80, some 90. God forbid I live to be 100. That's too old for me. I don't want... Man, if it gets to that point, oh man, Lord, take me, please. Take me. I don't want to get to that. That's too much for me. But what is that, even a hundred years, in light of eternity? And we worry so much about this little bit of time that we have here, especially as Christians, as we sojourn, as we're just passing through. Remember that, and we forget that we're just passing through. And Jesus is going to say, as we see, his point is, will he who gave us our life and our body now fail to provide all these things that we need? And when we worry, <laughs> we kind of think that sometimes. When you're worrying, you're like, oh, you know, thank you, God, for, you know, some of us in the morning. Thank you, Lord, for letting me open my eyes, and giving me another day, or whatever you may say to the Lord. Things of that nature, right? And those are good things to say. Praise the Lord. Thank him for all that you have. For everything. Always thank the Lord. But now you thank the Lord and then later you're like, oh, you know, and you start worrying. It's They don't go together. Is he who let you open your eyes in the morning now suddenly not going to provide what you need? Jesus is going to explain to us. So he's, he gives some examples here. Consider the ravens in verse 24. For they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, this is interesting, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? <laughs> Man, you get it like when he talks, you're like, oh. Well, I feel kind of small. <laughs> I don't feel very smart anymore, Jesus. Because <laughs> he puts it out there like, come on, guys, really? <laughs> like, just look at the big picture. So, he gives us the ravens. And here, as you look at the ravens, they're referred to here, when you look at it, as the most useless of birds. Now, I don't know if you guys... Have ever been close to crows or, oh man, they're so irritating when they're a bunch of them are around. Wah, 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 and you're like, oh, shut up, man. <laughs> you know, they're useless. Sparrows at least could be eaten, but the raven couldn't. So they're, just, they're, they're no good. And, and Jesus is saying, consider them, those no good, useless birds over there, just making noise. And yet God feeds them and you know that you're more valuable than them, right? All the disciples. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. Like, come on, man. is God not going to feed you? 
Like when you look at this, it's it's fairly simple when you look at it, but it's stuff that we need to be reminded of because we get bogged down with the things in life. Because we live in the valley, we have a tendency to to lose focus. We're people, right? That's the human condition. We live in the valley and we lose focus on Christ. We start worrying about our circumstances. And you could pull up, you could Google it. You know, give me a, a great, you know, sing. Keep your eyes on Christ during all circumstances. And well, you can find all kinds of different sayings, right? And it's true. We do. We lose focus. And we forget some of the simplest things. We forget that we're children of God, of the Most High. When you think about that, just, just think who you are in Christ. That should take all that worry and kick it out to the curb. You're a child of the Most High. I don't know about you guys, but that is awesome to be able to say that and to know that, that my Father in Heaven is the King of Kings. That takes that worry right out the door because I know this is not the end. I know where I'm going. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. He says, how much more value? You are of more value than the sparrows. We see that there in verse seven. If we go back, he says, you are of more value than the sparrow. So he's been saying this over time now through this. Now this is time for us, right? <laughs> this is all kind of one big thing for him. So he's giving all these examples and he's telling them, you guys are more valuable than these birds. God has not forgotten you. That's important to remember. So many times we cry out, God, you've forgotten me. When the storms come, because they will. It rains on the just and the unjust. We both encounter things. We all go through things. And we have a tendency of crying, God, you forgot me. God, I'm forgotten. And we, we talked about the last couple of weeks. That's one of the worst feelings in the world is to feel forgotten. And we feel like that sometimes, like God forgot us and God has not forgotten you. He never will. He never will. So we look at these birds. The birds are interesting, right? Because the birds are fed. The birds aren't made in the image of God. We are. Oh. <laughs> we are more valuable than the bird. These are things that we should always remember. And, and it's interesting because it's stuff we know, right? It, it's not anything new that I'm saying up here. But we forget. The birds. <laughs> yeah, this is so, it, it's almost basic. When you just look at them, the birds. And I, we have birds out here. I mean, the other day, a hawk, not the other day, probably like a month ago. What did it come down? It came down in my backyard and it got something. And it just, you know, with its claws, it ripped it and the insides are out. Oh, it got a pigeon. That's what it was. The hawk came down, got the pigeon. Remember, you, you saw it. My wife saw it. And I went out there. I was like, oh, there's like blood and guts out here. <laughs> and the hawk was just sitting there for a little bit. And you just look at the birds. God is, he's their God. And he's their creator. But our father, which one of creation can say that? Think about those things. Remember those things. When worry starts to creep in and the troubles in life start to rain down, our 
Father. It's an awesome thing to meditate on. It really is. We have a relationship with him as a child. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Think about that. Of all the creatures on earth, of all of creation, the children of God should be the least to worry. The least. And then he says, verse 25, which of you by worrying can add a cubit? So a cubit is 18 inches, right? To his stature. Helikia, it means the length of life or height. So there's some debate here when you read different commentaries on what this is actually saying. I think in, at least for me, I believe that in the context, it's speaking of length of life. I don't think that Jesus is saying which one of you can grow 18 inches, you know. <laughs> if you're already six foot, you know, I don't think you want to be... <laughs> Seven and a half feet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't think, I just don't think that. So, I think really when you look at it, because a cubit is 18 inches, I think, I believe Jesus is saying you can't add one step to the length of your life. Basically, what he's saying here by saying this, worrying accomplishes nothing. That's basically the gist of it. That's what Christ is trying to point out to us and to them. By your worrying, it's going to accomplish nothing. And here we go. Free information. Right? <laughs> worrying causes stress when you worry. And research shows that that deteriorates the immune system by worrying. It lowers T-cells. Now, if you're familiar with anything medical, you need T-cells for your immune system to work properly. Now, when it lowers that count, your immune system can't respond the way it's intended to respond. So by worrying, stress creates that in your body, which gets rid of T-cells. So not good. So this is not good. There's some other stuff here. It affects the brain. When you worry and the stress, it affects the brain, making you less able in the future to respond to it. It makes it harder for you to respond to future stress. So you're stressing out now, and it's affecting your brain. And later, when you go through something else, because we live in the valley, you're going to have a harder time responding to that stress. It has a definite effect on fertility, and it's also related to sudden heart failure. Stress, worry, not good. Jesus says, don't do it. Why? It doesn't do anything. You're accomplishing zero. And it's going to cause you bad health. Hey, it can cause baldness, so I've been real stressed out. <laughs> I got like a messed up golf course going on up here and divots and everything else. You're like, whoa, they just get rid of it. <laughs> so we see that stress actually, and we know this because we've probably all read an article a time or two in health magazines or at the doctor's office sitting there. And, well, they used to have like magazines out and you could read and look, and it's not so much like that. It's a weird place now, but <laughs> you used to be able to open and read different articles that were interesting. I used to like doing that, and you would read how stress affects the body and, and things to reduce stress. They even have like stress balls, and you roll it around in your hand. You're like, oh, you know, count to five, close your eyes, breathe in nice and, and easy, and you know, <sighs> relieve the stress, right? <laughs> they got all kinds of stuff. So we know it contributes to disease and poor health. Now somebody calculated that, this is interesting to me, so I put it. Now 40% of the things we worry about will never happen. 30% of the things are in the past and we can't even change it. 
12% of the things that we worry about are things that people criticized us about. 10% of the things we worry about are about health. And like we just saw, worry doesn't help health. <laughs> and only 8% are legitimate things to worry about. That's interesting to me. So don't worry. If this is correct, 92% of it <laughs> doesn't matter anyways. <laughs> But when you look at it, you start thinking, yeah, that's kind of true, because some of the things in the past you worry about and you start to just stress over. So we see that the reason here is because it doesn't do absolutely anything for us to worry. That's a reason to not worry, because guess what? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't add to your life. And in reality, we know it causes poor health, so it, it hurts your life to worry. So I guess the question becomes, if you can't do anything about it, why do we worry about it so much? Interesting. Jesus continues, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon... In all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now I can imagine as he says, even Solomon, the ears perk up of the people around because of who Solomon is to the Jew. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? <laughs> Man. So he says, consider. Now this is the second time he says, consider. So this means to consider closely, thoroughly learn, give attention, to be perceptive in regards to these things. So he's saying, take a look, pay attention, look at this closely, look at the lilies. And like I said, to the Jew, Solomon was the epitome of royal splendor. You know, we know all the money, he was wise, well... <laughs> That's always interesting when you say <laughs> Solomon was so wise, but yet had so many women. I don't know if you could say that was wise. <laughs> a thousand? <laughs> yeah, this, this is just a nightmare. That's a nightmare. Imagine trying to deal with a thousand women. <laughs> I'm a husband, and I'll just stop right there. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> So when they say when he says Solomon, they're all going to be like, "Wow, you know, they have they have a certain thought, a, a certain idea of Solomon." Yet he's not a, as beautifully arrayed as this flower. Hmm. And then it says God clothes the grass. So we see that God cares for the flowers and the grass and takes care of them. Simple stuff right here, guys. God will take care of you. Now we know this. First Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him for he what? Cares for you. He cares for you. And Jesus is just pointing out some basic stuff here as he looks around. Look, over there. Look at those dumb birds. Look at these flowers. You are so much more than that. Will God not take care of you? Oh, you of little faith. Now he says, oh, you of little faith. <laughs> oh, man, that would be like when he says that, I'd be like, oh, man. He wasn't talking to me. He was talking to you. <laughs> He's looking at you, not me. <laughs> man, oh, you of little faith. The idea is that it's a mistrust here towards the providence and care of God. And this is so true. We worry so much sometimes that we forget who we are. I said it earlier. We forget who we are in Christ. Who we are. That now all of a sudden, God's not going to get us through. God's going to leave us. He's going to forget us. 
And remember in context, as we look at all of this together, Jesus has been speaking on living life in light of eternity, not now. And these things that we worry about are now, are now. As a born again believer, the things I worry about now aren't going to be things I worry about in heaven. Because there's going to be like tables of prime rib. And <laughs> there's pastries everywhere. And the Lord's going to say, come on in, Micah, have your fill. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, that would be great, right? I just, oh, I love red meat. Oh. It's just so beautiful. Thank God for red meat. <laughs> Medium rare. Ooh. Okay, I better stop. So, remember the rich fool, the parable of the rich fool. He's, and we can get so weighed down like him by the things around us that we take our eyes off Christ. We get weighed down. We do, guys. And Jesus says, where's our faith? Oh, you of little faith. So where is our faith? Is it in us? In me? In my ability to do the things that I can do? Or is my faith, is my trust in the one who never fails? Because I know I fail constantly. Where's our faith? Where is our faith? Is it in me or is it in him? That's yeah, something you can ask yourself. I love this verse, 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Cannot deny himself. I love that verse because I'm faithless a lot of times. And I know he is faithful. There is not one promise in the Bible that he will ever break. You could take that to the bank. And much of, many of us don't go to the bank anymore because everything's online. But hey, <laughs> you used to be able to say that's a check that won't bounce. Who writes checks now? <laughs> Man, I think my mom does. Mommy write checks. I know. I love you, mom. <laughs> he... Will never break his promise. And he has told us he will take care of us. I am not a man that I should lie, the Bible says. He is not a liar. He is faithful. You are his child if you are a believer in God. If you are a believer in Christ. And the Bible says he'll take care of you. Stop worrying about it. Now, it's easy to say that, I know. Oh, you're up there because, you know, you teach the Bible. And, oh, oh, oh. and you guys have some crazy view of, of, of people who stand in a pulpit and teach and think a lot of people tend to think that we have some special access to God or some great relationship. That's, stop. That's not true. Quit it. Don't think that. These promises are just as true for me as they are for you. I have access to God the same way all of us, if you're a believer in Christ, have access to him. And you can hold on to these promises just as tightly as I can. And I want you guys to know not to worry. God will take care of you. Okay, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, verse 29, nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. So it says, do not seek. So if we look back, and if I turn my page here to verse 22 and we go back, he is giving or repeating that same admonition that he gave in verse 22. So, what we have here when he says, do not seek, is a negative 
present imperative. You must not continue to seek. So he's saying, don't seek. And don't worry. <laughs> so don't seek what you should eat or what you should drink. This is interesting because this makes me think of my son Samuel. He's little. He's two. And he's not worried at all in the least about what he's going to eat. He's not worried if there's going to be food on the table, if there's extra diapers upstairs. He's only two. He doesn't worry. Dad's got this. I'm going to eat and I'm going to have a clean diaper on my butt. Right? And <laughs> as, sad, as hard as it is to do, he's going to wipe the poop off my butt, you know, type of thing. I don't have to worry about that. Dad's got this, right? He's got it. That's how we should be. Our father, he's got this. Let him worry about that. I'm his child, and I look at Samuel, and he's not worried at all in the least. He's not worried at all in the least. Now, it says anxious mind. This is interesting, because remember I pointed this out before. There's some things that only Luke uses. Here, anxious mind, oh, this is one of those that only Luke uses. So this is the Greek word, metarizomai. It's where we get our word for meteor. So it means to be not in, a, in suspense. It means don't be constantly living in careful suspense. Like, ah, what's going to happen? Ah, what's going to happen? Don't be living like that. Don't have an anxious mind. That always makes me think when i seen that. That's where we get the word meteor. You think of like all the crazy movies. Like. <laughs> and you think, you know, don't have an anxious mind. You think of those movies like, is it going to hit us? Is it going to destroy the world? Or are we going to be able to do something that's going to side swipe the earth and go around and just whew, save the world again? You know, Morgan Freeman or somebody's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> somebody did something spectacular to save the world and we avoided being extinct. <laughs> from the meteor, right? But you, you picture the meteor and the things that come around and when it said anxious mind, I started thinking of those things. It actually means to, to not be in suspense. That's an interesting word. And only Luke uses this here. That's even more interesting because he had a... He was a smart guy, we'll say that. He was a physician. So <laughs> I don't want to go into too long of a thing there, but there's another imperative here. You must not, in the Greek language, you must not continue to be of a doubtful, a careful, a suspense-filled mind. Don't live that way is what Jesus is saying. Don't do that. And then it says, for all these things, the nations of the world seek after the pagan, the unbelieving nations of the world. That's what he's talking about here. They worry about the now. now we know that. And we, I could talk about this for probably, you know, until Jesus returns. <laughs> we all be like, yeah, yep, yeah, amen, hallelujah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They worry about the now about this life but not us not us they seek after that that's what the unbelieving world gives themselves to and worry it ties into all of this it's the reason why a lot oh it's one of the reasons why we have so many problems today it's because of worry. Because the worry turns into us trying to get. Because now we got to get because I don't know if I'll have tomorrow and I got to get it while it's hot. You know, the opportunity's right there. We got to strike while the iron is hot. And if I don't, I don't know tomorrow. Or I don't know the next week. Oh, we're not going to be able to do this and that. And I'm not saying not to plan and not to do things and not to be wise in your decisions and, and 
to think of those things. That's not what I'm saying, but we're so worried. We start hoarding. We try to get more wealth, more power, more security in life because we're worried about uh, what if the market crashes or what if what happens with the housing market happens again and everything's you know crazy and chaos and all this and my equities now now I'm upside down in my house and all oh, you know and if, you know you're pulling your hair out if you got any left and you know it's all it's all bad. These are all the things that the world is after: the power, the money security because they are so worried about this life because this life is the only life that matters and Jesus has been exhorting us to live in light of eternity for the after that because there is an after that I don't care who you are and what you believe you're going to find out soon enough We will all close our eyes. We're going to open it up and we're going to find out, oh, there is an after that. Oh, I should have listened to that crazy preacher guy. <laughs> I should have paid attention. He had that book in his hand that said the Bible. Yeah. We're going to find that out. And that's the tragedy because the world is so focused and the world wants you to focus on these things, so you take your eyes off Christ. And a lot of times they, and you see it in children, they try to indoctrinate children and make them believe that this world is as good as it gets. That's all there is, so live for the now. They don't want them to think about anything else. Because if you live for the now and you constantly live for this life, chances are you have no room for Jesus in your life. When you close your eyes here and you don't have Jesus, you're in for a rude, a rude awakening. So the nations seek after these things. The nations. And he says, your father knows he knows you need these things. So again, why worry? It's not going to accomplish anything, right? And your father already knows. So what do we need to do? And he says, this is what you need to do. You need to seek the kingdom of God. This right here should be our priority. Seeking the kingdom of God. Living in light of eternity. Replace the worry for the world with concern for the kingdom. What do we do? Jesus says right here, seek the kingdom of God. And what? All these things will be added. That doesn't mean you're going to seek the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to seek the kingdom of God and I'm going to wake up in the morning and Brand new Mercedes-Benz CL class is going to be out there in the front yard or with a bow like they show on TV. You know, and my wife's going to come out, oh, you know, and the, and the lights are going to shine down from somewhere and, you know, the harps will be playing and all that. This is to me in that. So here's a choice. What are we choosing? To worry about this life? Are we choosing to seek the kingdom of God? Seek the kingdom of God. Then he says, do not fear, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom there in verse 32. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so do not fear little flock okay so he's talking to the disciples they're not big you know 
when you look at this and he's saying little flock and, and you, you just try to picture Jesus speaking in comparison to the Jewish nation and, and Judaism, they're, they're small in, in relative terms. We're small even to this day in relative terms. You can go to a church that's 8,000, but what is that in comparison in light of the rest of the city? That's maybe 300,000. Very small. Little flock. Little flock. I like this too. They may be small, but we are his. We are his. And we are his flock. Whew. That's such a relief. To know what greater shepherd we have. And that we are his. And we are his flock. Now the tense of the verb here encompasses all ages. This means all of us. So that's us now listening online. That's us sitting here. We are part of this little flock. So that's awesome. Better a little flock with the good shepherd than a big flock with a hireling. Remember that, guys. So, even though we are little, we are his. And because we are his, we should not fear. Then he says, it is your father's good pleasure. Again, I always like this, and I always point it out, your father. Not just, Jesus isn't saying, my father. He's saying, your father. It's personal. I love that. Every time I see this, I'm just like, yeah. And it's his good pleasure. His delight to give. So don't worry. That's the title of the message. I couldn't think of anything great to put, so I just put don't worry. Right? <laughs> don't worry. So that's what we should be doing. Not worrying. Let's not worry. Paul said this in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing. We know this. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, notice peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace of God. Be anxious for nothing. <clears throat> Some of us, we have peace with God. And some of us don't have the peace of God. As we are so anxious, we are so worried, we're, we have that divided mind. That's that same word there, Maranao. And we don't have the peace of God. We have peace with God through Christ. We're born again. <laughs> we're so messed up. We have a divided mind. It's tearing us up. We're, you know, it's causing us health issues because we're so stressed out. We lost hair. <laughs> this is something I need to work on then. <laughs> but again, don't worry. Then he says, sell what you have. Sell what you have. There in verse 33. And give alms. This is in contrast to the rich fool. He held on to everything. I'm just going to keep it. And that's the world. They want to hoard. They want to keep for themselves. They don't want to give away unless they get a tax credit, right? <laughs> well, I get something here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look charitable and I might give to this charity over here. But little do people know there's a big, huge tax write-off. So they actually gain more by giving <laughs> than, than anything. So... He says here to be generous, give alms, give to the less fortunate. So we see that's in contrast to that rich fool. He wanted to hoard, he wanted to keep it. 
And so we see giving is an antidote for covetousness. Remember, this all goes together. It was interrupted by the kid or the brother who said, hey, you know, you've been saying some cool things, but I, I got something to say that's completely off the wall. You know, <laughs> make my brother divide the her inheritance. But all this is flowing together. So giving is an antidote for covetousness. And it's always such a, it's such a neat thing when you give. Um, I'm not going to go into too big of a thing on it, but it's always a neat thing. It's always cool to, to see the reaction of others and to see the joy that's put on someone else's face and in their life because you give. I'll say that much. So we see... And we've been seen as we go through this and as I look at it now to stop living for this life and to start living for the next. Start investing in the next life because there is a next one. And if you invest solely in this life, you will have nothing when you close your eyes. All you will have is a storage full of stuff. <laughs> that some unknown family member is going to be fighting over. <laughs> don't, don't be that person. Start investing. Focus on Christ. It profits you nothing to invest solely in this life and have nothing for the next. Be good stewards. We see that too. We've been looking at that. Why? Because treasure... In heaven, it doesn't fail. We see that, right? It doesn't fail, it can't be stolen, and it can't be destroyed. Like a lot of stuff here, like I have some comic books and stuff. If if there's a fire, it's going to burn all that stuff up. My baseball cards and my signed baseballs and all that. It's nice. I like looking at it like, whoa, Stan Musial. He was <laughs> awesome for the Cardinals. I, you know, I never got to see him play, but I saw highlights, but... You know, things like that. That stuff is cool and all, but I can't take it with me. The house catches fire, it all burns. Because I'm going to get my kids, not my baseballs. <laughs> if the house catches fire, there's more important stuff than that. But eh, maybe I'll go back for that stand usual. Maybe my Yogi Berra. But <laughs> I don't know if I can part with that stuff. But in heaven, none of that stuff is going to burn. It won't be destroyed. All that treasure, all those crowns. Woo! I can't wait to get to heaven. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be awesome. We actually get to see the Lord face to face. Imagine that. You sit around sometimes thinking about what that day will be like. And it's so hard to wrap my mind around. You don't know, like that song says, I can only imagine. I'm not going to sing, but... <laughs> You know, it's an interesting thing when you really start to think about it. What will I do? What will we do? I have no idea, but I'm excited to find out what I will do. <laughs> I can't wait for that. And then he says, we'll close it out. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. Where are you invested? Where are you investing? That's where your heart is. It's like that saying, right? You got skin in the game. You better believe when you got money on the table, you're watching everything that's going on with that because you got an investment there. You want to see how it's doing. You know, I used to gamble and do, you know, parlays and different things and and just when you got money out there, you're watching it. You better believe you got skin in the game because you've invested something and you want a return. <laughs> you're paying attention. So where, what are you investing in? Because that's where your heart is. What are we investing in? Ask yourself. That'll tell you right away because that's where your heart is. That's where your heart is. Is it in the things of God? 
I don't want everyone to shout because I don't need to know. This is for you and for your relationship with the Lord. You ask yourself, what am I investing in? What's important to me? Where is my treasure? Because that's where my heart is. Do I want a greater walk with Christ? Do I want to share the gospel message? Do I want to see people saved? Do I want the Holy Spirit to bring conviction? Or do I want the new boat? Or do I want to get a luxury suite at Dodger Stadium? Or I want to go to the Super Bowl because it's here in L.A. So I got to work extra overtime. I got to put in hours. Sorry, family. Sorry, God. You know, football's more important. I got to get to the Super Bowl. What are we investing in? And where is our treasure? Very interesting what Jesus has to say here. I love this because it's, it is so true. What's in your heart always comes out. You could tell, you could tell a person who loves Jesus. You, just, you could tell what people love because that's where their heart is. I love this. Is your heart, and that's what we're looking, set on material possessions? Is it? Are we chasing the new car, the big home, working all this OT, sacrifice? Sacrificing the family, my relationship with the Lord to get all these fancy and nice things in life. And I'm not saying it's not, you know, I'm not saying it's sin to have a nice house and to drive a nice car. That's not what I'm saying, but where's your focus? Remember, because we've, we've seen that Paul said covetousness is idolatry because it takes the place of God and it, you're now bowing your knee to that. Is our life so wrapped up in the now, on the material, that will tell me that I'm living for this life. I'm living for this one. Or am I seeking, like Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God? And that tells me that I'm living for the next. Where is our hearts? Are we so worried about this life and have no care about the next? <clears throat> so worried about all the little things that we've forgotten how big our God is, how great he is, how much he loves us. Man, I could go on forever, guys. You read this and it strikes a chord. And it's sad because so many of us, even as Christians, and I'll close with this thought, we forget. And we get so consumed and wrapped up in this life and living and wanting the nicer things that even as Christians, we, we put God in the back seat. And we start living for the now. We shouldn't be doing that, guys. We get so worried, so wrapped up, so weighed down. It's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? The world needs us now more than ever to be on fire for Christ. To be on fire. That's what the world needs now. Born again believers who are on fire for Jesus Christ. Let that be said of us. I look around, little flock. That blesses my heart. Let that be us. A little flock on fire for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
so much, so much, Father, and help us, Lord, as we look at this, things come up in life, and we, we sometimes, our faith shrinks or becomes little, Lord, and we forget. Help us not to worry, Lord, to always remember that we are your child, that you are faithful, even when we're faithless, Lord. That these promises you have given to us in your word will never be broken. May we hold fast to these things, Lord. And as the days grow darker and the time is growing near for your return, Lord, may we be more determined in our hearts and our minds to serve you, to love you, to walk with you even greater. So, Father, be with us. Help these things take root in our heart. Father, we love you. Continue to work in and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you guys online. I see you guys. Hazel, I don't know if you're still in the Middle East. God bless you. Love you. Vero, I should see you tomorrow morning. I love you guys. God bless. If you guys need any prayer, please put it on any page. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. I love you. I'll see you next week.